Welcome to BYU's Tech Transfer Podcast. This is Dave Brown, and I'm here today with Michael Davis, who's a student entrepreneur and leader, one of the leaders of Biohive here on campus. So, Michael, will you tell us a little bit about your background and maybe what Biohive is as well? Yeah, absolutely. So, um, I have a background in genetics, genomics, and biotechnology, and Biohive is. Would you like to know about the like biotech community, or would well, you like to know about the software? I really want to know about your startup company, okay. but since you're doing something interesting on campus, um, Biohive is a student chapter of Bio Utah, which is a large entity for bio companies, right? So, what's your plan for Biohive, and and how is that going with the students? Yeah, Biohive is they're doing a really great job of doing outreach for the biotech community in Utah. It's actually the fastest growing life science community in the nation right now. And so we're a student chapter of that larger entity, like you said. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a University of Utah chapter, a Utah State chapter, and then there's a BYU chapter. And so we're super excited to be uh, running some speaker series events with some large biotech companies like Recursion, like Myriad Genetics, like ARUP, and we're bringing them in so they can partner with a lot of the students and create some pipelines of jobs uh, just because we know that that's a big need right now in the biotech community. Great. And then you have professors like uh, Mike Stark and Tim Jenkins and others here on campus in life sciences who are just doing a lot to make entrepreneurship happen and be plugged into Bio Utah, right? Yeah, they're incredible. I mean, Stark, Dean Stark, he's really plugged into the Bio Utah sphere right now. And he's doing a great job of getting BYU plugged into that so we can contribute in big ways. And then Professor Jenkins, he's running the bio innovations class right now. It's bio innovations 444 if you're a STEM student and you're interested. But right now they're working to uh, help students learn how to commercialize a lot of technologies in the biotech sphere. It's really mm -hmm. an amazing class. I cannot recommend it enough. Yeah, when I talk to people elsewhere on campus in the business school or wherever, I tell them, you know, there's something really interesting happening in life sciences, and it's you guys over there. So, but we're here mainly to talk about your startup company. So, yeah. what, what's your company? What are you doing? Essentially, my company is HyVio, H Y V dot I O, and we help commercialize early stage technology by creating a niche marketplace of academic IP. And so, I've spent my entire four years in of undergrad in labs, and during that time, I was at a lab, and I thought. I had some really cool technology to bring to a market. Mm -hmm. And um, I realized that it was already published. And so I had no idea that if something's published, you can't make a company out of it, or it's really hard to uh, bring that technology to market without a patent beforehand. Now, if anyone, if anyone listening to this is panicking for a second there, we do have a 12 month grace period in the US. So if you publish, you just need to be like prudent and take some action afterwards. But yeah, if it's been over a year, you're probably out of luck on something capital intensive. Yep, exactly. Yeah, sorry, don't panic too much. <laughs> yeah. And so as a result, uh, that paper was probably read by like 200 people and cited a bunch, mm -hmm. but it was kind of a little forgotten rather than making a difference in the world. Uh, mm -hmm. And so I, I looked at that and I took the bioinnovation 444 class from um, Jenkins and realized that, you know, we could have a big impact by trying to increased throughput of all these amazing technologies and trying to get them to commercialization a little bit faster. So basically mm -hmm. we just collect grant proposals and auto populate those into profiles that are viewable by verified investors. Okay. So let's walk through that for a second. So where do you find the grant proposals? Yeah. So what we do is we have a Google Chrome extension where basically once the, it, uh, the scientists, they, uh, find our extension, they download it, and then whenever they go to upload a grant proposal, they just get a little link saying, hey, would you like to also download this in our software? And so we take that and then auto-populate it for them. So it's super easy for the uh, scientists, mm -hmm. and we try to uh, make it as frictionless as possible. <laughs> okay, so the scientists are getting kind of a free service from you, essentially, yeah. right? And so you're receiving their information, and is it is it confidential when you receive it, or...? How does yeah. that work? Yeah, it's confidential. It's only um, verifiable um, or only viewable by verified investors. And yeah. so there, nothing is going to get disclosed as far as starting that timeline of um, those 12 months before you can lose your ability to publish. Okay. And here's something I haven't talked to you about before, but so tech, traditionally in technology transfer, a university professor discloses something to our office. 
And then that just starts the machine moving. Then we're thinking, okay, is it patentable? Is there a market for it? Is this a professor who wants to be involved in commercialization and all these things? But you're starting way before that. You're back at the grant proposal. That could be a year before it gets to us, yeah. essentially. And I have thought before, maybe tech transfer should be a little more like that. Maybe we should be looking at publications and not waiting for things to be disclosed to us. Any thoughts on that? Yeah, that's actually why we're really happy to be partnering with you guys, because mm -hmm. we know that that's a, a kind of a little bit of a gap in a lot of universities, actually. Yeah. And we, we'd love to be able to help universities close that gap because we just want to help as many life altering technologies reach the marketplace. Absolutely. And I would think um, when you're thinking, I was going to ask you next about challenges with your business, but let me throw yeah. out a specific challenge. Uh, if I were a VC, VCs already, venture capitalists will tell us these technologies are really raw coming out of universities. They need a lot of development. Now you're grabbing them even earlier, kind of before the research has been done when it's just a concept. It, it might be patentable, but it's just a concept. Do the VCs say, whoa, 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 this is too early or how do they respond? Yeah. So every VC has their own thesis, you know, and some mm -hmm. VCs, they're going to be entirely focused on the things that are ready to market right now. But I've done my due diligence and I've talked to a lot of VCs actually, and there's enough out there that are really interested in life-changing technologies and being the first ones to know about it is what they really yeah. would like. They, you know, if you can find about find out first about the next CRISPR, then why wouldn't you want that? Right. Okay. And so for, for anyone less familiar with venture capital, if uh, what it means to have a thesis is each fund, each venture capital fund that looks to invest in something will have some a concept of what they're trying to invest. So here we're saying, so your thesis might be uh, we invest between 500,000 and a million dollars in companies that have already received angel investment, for example, that could be part of it. And you'd probably get narrower than that and say in their software companies or something, you know, have yeah. some profile of what you're after. And so here, I think what you're suggesting, Michael, is that some VCs, they can choose whatever thesis they want. They could say, no, 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 we're going to be super early and we're going to invest money. It might not even be a very smart investment. What we want is access. And then we'll know when the next big thing's coming and we'll already be buddies with those guys. Yeah, exactly. They really like that early access and being the first ones to know. And that can be a entirely different person's thesis or different venture capital firm's thesis. Mm -hmm. Okay. And don't tell us anything you don't want to, but um, I would see monetizing this as being challenging, coming up with, okay, what is the pricing model? What is this worth to a VC? How have you approached that? Yeah. So a uh, solid start starting point for us was PitchBook. Uh, and mm -hmm. they'll charge like 25 grand for a seat okay. or a couple seats. Uh, we obviously don't have as large of a uh, pool to, or I guess customer base right now, just because we're focusing on Utah and really helping Utah. Mm -hmm. And so uh, commercializing it, we've gone about the subscription model and just working with VCs and feeling out what they're comfortable with i don't actually <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> i don't want to like name a specific yeah, price of course. point yeah um i will say it, it varies between right now so i don't know we maybe we can talk about this a little bit on the podcast but uh, i know that mm -hmm. it's pretty common in SaaS companies to um, charge different price points from different customers right um and so we run into that a little bit where you know, one venture capital firm says, hey, this is what we can pay for. We know that you're asking for this much. Um, as you build out your functionality, we'd love to be able to reach this price point eventually. And so we're doing that right now with two companies of, in sense. terms of like building out our functionality and building our price point along with it. Mm -hmm. um, so I know that a lot of people don't like talking about that. <laughs> yeah, that's it's kind of like. Maybe people listening to the podcast do. I don't know. We're, we're still getting a handle on who wants to listen to this sort of material. But the um, one of the great things about SaaS is that you can charge variable prices. Like you can figure out which segment of the cut of the market or of the consumers is willing to pay what price and, and target like that. Yeah. So that's I think that's completely reasonable. And you're dealing with sophisticated investors like these are VCs. Yeah. So they understand that, too. Right. Yeah, they they're totally understand it. And a lot of their portfolio companies are doing the same thing. So oh. they're, they're coming from a really understanding. Point. Yeah. <laughs> and let me, in case anyone didn't catch that, let me point out. So Michael, how far into the company are you? Uh, we're like a year in. A year in and you have customers, you have paying customers already. Yeah. And so that's pretty great. The, um, I, I was going to ask you for, for milestones and achievements so far, getting paying customers has got to be one of the big ones. Yeah. So we actually participated in BYU's 
summer launch pad program. Right. And that was like their biggest emphasis is that like if you don't have paying customers, then you don't actually have anything to measure. <laughs> right. Like there you can't measure success until you have at least one paying customer and you're able to grow that from there. Yeah. Uh, and so I was really grateful to the summer BYU summer launch pad program for drilling that into me, just knowing that revenue is the greatest yeah benchmark that you can use for your company's success. Yeah, and so let me run this past you because I was meeting with another student entrepreneur today, a licensee of ours. He's no longer a student, but he was a student when he started. And he has a software company and things are moving slower than he expected, but he does have a steadily growing base of customers. And they're not, they'd be a way different price point than yours, but they're paying monthly for his service. And we were talking about the speed. It seems to me that, um, and let me know if this is what the, the summer program says as well, that what you want is to get some paying customers, even if it's not covering your bills, just so there's some money coming. And then the whole business from then on is just to optimize that. Say, how do we get more people like this? How do we make it a little more profitable and so on? Yeah, it, that's exactly what it is. I mean, once you have that starting point, then you're able to work with a lot of the optimization, figuring out what your true business model is. It might shift, you yeah. know, it really is subject to change and that's okay. Yeah, and so, this is a technology you came up with on your own, right? Like you've developed this and we've talked about it over time, but um, the uh, for a tech transfer company, uh, what can happen for us sometimes is someone might license a technology from tech transfer and then they get into it and they pivot and the technology is not even that important anymore. Yeah. So um, have you seen, how has is, how is your technology changed as you've, as you've progressed in one year? Yeah, so originally we went from a software that was aimed to help academics write grant proposals. We, that's oh, okay. actually where we started. Okay, I didn't know that. Um, and so we realized that academics, one, yes, they spent like maybe two months on these grant proposals. It was crazy. And we were like, oh, we could shorten that up for them, we'll use AI to kind of streamline that. But after that, an even bigger roadblock for them was getting government funding. And there was really a lack of funding. And so yeah. we started asking, hey, would you be open to private funding? And a lot of feedback that we got prior to talking to the, the academics was that they would never ever want private funding. They're like very anti. Oh, okay. They like it would be a bad mark on their academic research. Like people would be like, oh, they're running yeah. by these people. And yeah. so we said we were kind of discouraged by that by everyone else telling us. We just talked to a hundred academics and we just interviewed them and said, "What are your thoughts?" <laughs> right. And and. Uh, only one academic said that they wouldn't want private funding if it was available to them out yeah. of 100. So, okay, interesting. Um, we then, from there, pivoted saying, okay, well, can we try and get these people more access? And what's the, the process to be able mm -hmm. to do that? And mm -hmm. that's where we reached the point of still going through the grant proposal um, point of view, but mm -hmm. then pivoting to increase the audience of the academics rather than trying to decrease their timeline. <laughs> Okay, so um, so let's walk through how this could work for an academic. So say I'm a professor, yeah. uh, there'll be professors listening to us. So I'm doing my grant proposal, I'm using your plugin. And so when I submit the grant proposal, I know the information is going to you too, you're aware of it. And either I get the grant that I'm applying for or I don't, but either way, there's some investors now, some VCs who know what I'm trying to do. What what might happen next for me? I was like, oh. Yeah, so let's say that you're an academic who just submitted that we auto populate you a profile based off of your grant proposal. You can change it however you like, but it makes mm -hmm. it easy for you. If I'm a venture capitalist, I'm looking at a profile like yours because I'm interested in, I don't know, let's say machine learning and biology. And so they find your profile, find your technology. If they think it's interesting, they can reach out to you directly through that uh, profile. Mm -hmm. And then they can set up a call, be able to set up a relationship and invest in any future technologies that you might be working in or the technology that you've already planned um, from your grant proposal. Okay. So, that's so yeah, so maybe you don't get the grant you applied for, but you get funded anyway from this private entity. Yeah, exactly. Okay. And you know, corporate uh, sponsored research, well, I don't have national numbers on it, but my sense is that that's a growing area of, uh, of funding for professors. Every few years, um, professors across, you know, at conferences I go to and so on, will start to get worried that the federal government's gonna cut back on spending or something. So you think of federal funding as being very safe, but that's not necessarily true. That can ebb and flow. And uh, VC funding, if you're in an area that's commercial, that could be that could be a great option for professors. Yeah, and I think that a lot of professors are realizing that their technology is gonna have a lot larger impact on society when they go through the commercial route or through 
you know, the public route. Yeah. Uh, or the private route, sorry, excuse me. Uh -huh. yeah. <laughs> and, you know, when your technology is able to be commercialized, you're making a lot bigger impact on the people that you're trying to impact rather than it just going straight to uh, a journal. Mm -hmm. um, also, when, when you apply for a federal grant, most of the time, it's kind of a one-off grant. Like if you get an SBIR, there could be a follow-on or something, but um, corporations don't want that. They want long-term relationships. And that's what we see happen here on campus as well. I was just at the Licensing Executive Society conference, annual conference, and there were some corporate people, biopharma people talking, and they were saying, you know, we trust the professors because they know and we know that this isn't a single transaction. We're going to do like have a relationship over time, multiple grants, multiple licenses and so on. So that can be actually a really great thing. Correct? I'd actually push back on that a little bit. Just be, You mm -hmm. said that um, a lot of times it can be one off grants. Mm -hmm. What I found out in my research and talking to academics and there's uh, an NIH published peer published paper on this mm -hmm. and that the greatest indicator of getting a future grant from the government is if you already have one. So once okay. you're in that pipeline, actually, it's mm -hmm. remarkably exponentially more easy to get another grant. Okay. But getting that ball rolling is so incredibly difficult, especially if you're uh, an early professor in your career, you know, first five years right. and you, you don't have that set up. So we, we yeah. had a lot of interest from younger professors that were still trying to establish their research. Yeah. And tell me if you agree with this or not. The I think the way I would explain that, I think, is the reason one grant would lead to another is because you kind of know how to work the system, how to how to apply in a way that agencies respond to. Right. Yeah, exactly. It's all about uh, velocity of your research, really. And so once okay. you get that grant, you're able to publish. You understand yeah, you publish three leader. times in a year to be able yeah. to get the next grant and you understand how that works and you get the ball rolling. But when you don't have funding for your research or for your area of interest, it's really hard to get that initial funding. Yeah. That's, that's what I'd say. OK, well, terrific. So let's see. I, I breezed through challenges a little bit. Is there any other challenge you face that you want to talk about? Um, yeah. <laughs> so. I thought that it would be very easy um, and it is to bootstrap the project and by bootstrapping, I mean, mm -hmm. it's self funding funded. We didn't want to get VC funding. Um, I think that when you're early stage, it's really great to have the, the freedom to to pivot uh -huh. on your own accord. <laughs> uh <-huh. laughs> uh, um, however, you what I figured out was that you have to figure out other ways to show your team um, the value in what you're building, because okay. let's say you get venture capital funding and you get 10 million investment or something. Mm -hmm. That's a kind of a, a signal to everyone. You're like, oh, yeah, we're right. doing something interesting. And so what I was really a, a unique challenge that I ran into was that you have to figure out other ways to keep your team motivated and focused on what you're building when you are bootstrapped. <laughs> yeah, that's interesting. Yeah. yeah, I was just talking to someone today who could fund his own company, but he said, which most entrepreneurs will, I'm, I'm seeking outside funding because I just want to make sure I'm not drinking my own Kool-Aid. I want to have that badge of credibility from someone yeah. else. So that's a real thing. And we've had many university startups that have totally bootstrapped. So we'll we'll have a little equity on the front end and then they completely bootstrap and so they exit and we haven't been diluted at all that's great yeah like i love that but um but there are challenges to bootstrapping and there's yeah. one of them exactly and so a uh, solution that i've kind of figured out is just getting your team talking with customers too like the, okay you know you might like i work a lot on the back end but i have someone else that helps me uh and so let, let's say he's just coding like a maniac uh mm -hmm. he still needs to talk to customers that would be interested in the product that he's building and when mm -hmm. he sees that, you know, they really care about it, that makes him feel like he's doing something interesting. You know? Yeah. Okay. And let me ask you, Michael, what year in school are you? Yeah, I'm a senior. So you're a senior this year. So you started this as a junior, essentially, yeah. and worked over the summer and you're into it. And so um, you're, and, and so people listening should realize, like, this is a college student we're talking to. You're very sophisticated about um, entrepreneurial things and financing and so on, because you've been through all this, right? You've learned by doing. Did you, how much of this did you know before you did the startup? Yeah, um, I'd say about like five percent. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's it's totally okay to not know anything. I I've been very much like a life science lab student, just in the lab, and I I didn't really think that I would be able to know a lot about the business world. But uh, just as the nature of also building a product for venture capital, <laughs> that's also a, a unique, uh, I guess, way to go about. A product a lot of people are trying to get funding from venture capitals not 
money from the right, venture capital. Right. Exactly. Well, and that should lead, I mean, it could lead to some opportunities. You're obviously talking to a lot of, a lot of venture capitalists. Some of them could see this and say, hey, I, I want in on that. Yeah, they could. Uh, I think that I'd probably want to get a lot more established before I took on any further venture capital funding. <laughs> right. Yeah, you don't uh, want to take it if you don't need it. Yeah, it, it makes great connections for sure. Great. And so I want to ask you about uh, collaboration and networking just a little bit. So you're very networked in the BYU community. You know all the entrepreneurs in life sciences and probably a lot of the ones in the business school, as well as faculty members. A lot of students, like as an undergrad, I, I did not do that. Like I was just going through doing my classes, right? And that's what a lot of students do. How has networking impacted you and your business? Yeah, I mean, it's literally the difference between success and failure. It's mm -hmm. I, I would not have been able to do this without talking to as many, and I mean as many people as I could have. And mm -hmm. I think that that's actually a, a real reason why a lot of students struggle is they don't block out time for anything outside of their schoolwork. And right. so a big recommendation, recommendation that I have for students is to take some kind of research class or course, business validation course that will allow you to block out time to actually do that footwork because mm -hmm. it is work, even though it's networking. <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. No, super amount of work, like reaching out to people, reaching out to venture capitalists, people who are hard to contact. How do you get introductions with business people? Yeah. I, so one always put a student card, like yes. always put a student card. Right. Uh, you'd be shocked at like the amount of CEOs that would respond right away within five minutes to your email, just because you say that you're a student. And if you're, if they share your alma mater, even better, you know? Right. Uh, Another thing is just treat every um, interaction or connection that you have um, with a high level of respect because those will almost always lead to other connections. Mm -hmm. You know, I went to a a summit, a, like a biotech mm -hmm. summit, and met someone, and his connections have made a remarkable impact on mine. And I had no idea who he was when I ran into him at this summit, uh -huh. but his connections, he's now a member of a board on a venture capital firm, but uh, his connections have been hugely, hugely influential. And I never would have known if I hadn't just said hi to him in line. <laughs> yeah. And, and it's like you say, playing the student card, just telling people, hey, I'm a BYU student. I'm trying to do such and such. Like, people are going to help you. People are going to help you. They want to help. Uh, this kind of ecosystem in Utah is hugely helpful. Like I, they're so kind and anyone in Utah, they just want to give back and help in any way possible. Yeah. It's awesome. Really true. And so that's some great advice for aspiring entrepreneurs. What else would you tell some student? And, you know, honestly, listening to you, I, I just can't help but think if someone's studying business at BYU, you've got to do a startup company. Why wouldn't you, you know, isn't that part of the education? I think you should. And so, but if someone wants to, and, Maybe they're nervous. I had a different podcast episode with Jason Lau where we were talking about reasons people might not want to start a, a company. Uh, what would you tell someone who's interested? In starting a company? Yeah. Oh, um, you got to fail <laughs> like a lot yeah. and be okay with it too. And so I, I was reading this thing about someone who was asking for someone else to teach them something. And they were mm -hmm. like, please teach me how to do this. And the person said, why would I teach you if I teach, if someone will only learn when someone else teaches them? when it comes to matter, like you'll never yeah. be able to actually learn. You have to learn how to learn yourself and fail. Yeah. And so if you are counting on someone else to teach you how to start a business, it's just never going to happen. Right. You have to just go do it yourself. And as you do it, you'll find out that everyone wants to help you. Like everyone. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Yeah. And I, I guess say one time I was talking to, and, and this was a business guy and I, I raised some issue. I don't remember financing issue, whatever. And he said, well, you know, no one ever taught me that. I thought, whoa, whoa, whoa. <laughs> that's not, that's not how it works. You yeah, got to teach yourself it. that. So, um, well, that's really great. And so if you're starting from scratch, trying to educate yourself on business, uh, where would you go first? Like you're a student who just starting from zero. Yeah. Um, I think it depends what college you're in. Yeah. Um, and also what kind of business you want to build actually. Yeah. Um, I think that the Marriott school is really, really great at SaaS companies. Mm -hmm. Um, if you're interested in starting a business in the Marriott school, I'd say you should definitely join their, oh gosh, what is their program? The Rollins Center, the Sandbox program. Sandbox program. Of, yeah. yeah, that's like a year long program that literally teaches you how to build a SaaS company from the ground up within a year. Mm -hmm. um, if you're a STEM student, look at maybe the Crocker Innovation Program. 
they they do really great stuff with commercialization. If you're like an engineering student interested in um, Internet of Things mm -hmm. products, and then if you're in biotech, I'd recommend taking Bio Innovations four four four. Yeah, I feel like that probably covers the different colleges. Yeah, no, that's that's exactly right. That's um. A, probably exactly what I would say. So somewhere along the line, uh, you came by and introduce, introduced yourself to me. Like you say, you talked to a lot of people. Um, why did tech transfer interest you and how has learning about tech transfer affected what you're doing? Yeah, so I originally met tech transfer. I was introduced to it when the previous director was here. Oh yeah. And I, I told him my idea and he said, that's the worst idea I've ever heard. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. good frank criticism. That's, that's yeah. what you need sometimes. Exactly. And that's another form of help. Like, take that with a grain of salt, always. Yeah. Um, but I'm pretty tenacious, and I feel like I didn't get any good reasons for why it was the worst idea ever. Uh -huh. Or I got one um, that was solid. And that's when I went to the academics to then ask them, what is your opinion on it, on this technology? Uh, and so I kind of came back with a little bit of, like, here, you know, like, like yeah. a, a little bit of like, not spite, but resolve, you know? Yeah, well, so he gave you his opinion, which was a theory, and then you went and tested it and came back with the data. That's what it's all about. Yeah. Um, really be data led in everything that you do. It, test everything and you'll fail a lot more than you're right, but that's good. <laughs> yeah. That's I happen to be right in this point, uh, at this point. And so I was really happy about it. I brought it back to Mike and he said, oh, that's really interesting. And I kept explaining to him what was, what was going on. And he said, oh, that, that's really cool. Would you like an advisor? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. At which point I was like, yeah, let's like, let's workshop this and, and work through it. Uh, and so that's kind of how it all started. That's I didn't, good. what was the question again? <laughs> oh, um, let's see. I was asking why, how you got in contact with uh, Tech Transfer and, yeah. and how that related to what you were doing. Yeah. So it just kind of came out of some resolve and, you know, I was really glad that I, I talked to technology transfer because I, I, I talked to a lot of technology transfer right. offices with my uh, software, and I really think that BYU is special. Like, yeah, it's really awesome here. You guys are so collaborative. You guys are open to changing the way things are done and mm -hmm. really just the success of the students. I think it's, it's really incredible what you guys are doing here. Yeah, well, really appreciate that. And uh, so, Michael, when I first met you, you came in and you were doing essentially market research for your product. You were asking, well, what kind of information could you give to VCs and so on, just kind of feeling out some parameters there. Yeah. And it made a lot of sense to me. And um, this is another good lesson for students, maybe, that uh, it was clear to me that you weren't here to license a technology. You weren't like a tech transfer customer. But I thought, hey, pretty interesting and, you know, interesting engaging with you. Maybe we can help you out a little bit. And I think most tech transfers, Offices at universities would want to, you know, help students out in some way, even if even if it's not that sort of commercialization issue. Hopefully, that that is that is the hope. So um, you've also so you're a teaching assistant. You help other students who are interested, some of whom do look at our technologies here. What um, what do you think is a good strategy for looking at technologies for a student like that? Yeah, I think that it really depends on every student. Every student's going to have a different lens and different background, which is hugely beneficial. So I I, mm -hmm. I struggle to tell them how to do it because I, I'd like, I, I know that their own background will lend towards their own um, commer like technologies that they're interested in. But first, come to the technology transfer office is my number one recommendation. Mm -hmm. Talk to Dave, talk to anyone here, and they'll point in the right direction. And Follow your gut. <laughs> that's yeah. the worst advice. No, that's but that's pretty good because the um what it is is like you nailed it earlier where you have to be willing to to fail at some point. And I can't. I wish I could cite the quote, but someone somewhere said <laughs> the key to success is being willing to embarrass yourself in public. Yeah. And man, I found that to be true. You, you just got to do things. And we've done a few things lately where I thought this could go really badly, but we got to try something, folks. Yeah. And so so we're doing it. Yeah, I think it's awesome that this technology transfer office is so led by, you know, the entrepreneurial spirit as well. It makes sense yeah, that it would be. <laughs> you would hope so, but yeah. it doesn't have to be. But yeah, um, well, so great. Well, thanks, Michael. So good luck and I appreciate you coming and, and spending some time with us here. I hope it's um, it's helpful to get out word about what you're doing a little bit, but it seems like it's going awfully well. So, so good job and good luck this year.
Thank you. I appreciate it. All right. And we'll be back next week with another episode.